A very good evening to you. A very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Lord. And in our headlines, the Sage is set to honor the mighty Griner with renaming of the Spring Garden Highway tomorrow. A leading recycler is asking for better regulation of the industry. Rum industry officials are pushing for responsible drinking. And in sports, Sri Lanka lose an opportunity for a semi-final berth after defeat by a struggling South Africa team. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. And in our top story, the stage is set and the curtains will soon be drawn for the renaming of the Spring Garden Highway to the Mighty Griner Highway. Speaking exclusively to CBC News this evening, NCF CEO Carol Roberts Reefer says that all systems are go. The ceremony is a public ceremony, free to members of the public to attend. It starts at 4.30 in the afternoon on the Spring Garden Highway. The, one of the highlights of the evening ceremony will be the unveiling of the road sign uh, bearing the name of the Mighty Griner, the Mighty Griner Highway. And I would want to say that the Mighty Griner specifically requested that the new highway be named after his stage name and not his given name, hence the Mighty Griner Highway. Of course, there will also be musical tributes, and afterwards the streets will come alive with the sounds of Griner hits, both past and present. And I deliberately say present because just a week ago, the Mighty Griner at 73-odd years made it to the semifinals of this year's Soka Monarch competition. So we hope to do it under fair skies, and we invite members of the public to come out and join the government, the Ministry of Creative Economy, Culture and Sports and Producers, the National Cultural Foundation, to truly celebrate the body of work and the legacy of MacDonald Blenman, the mighty Griner, the king of the road. Well, a stalwart in the recycling industry wants that sector better regulated, especially with the ban on single-use plastics scheduled to come into effect in just a few days' time. Managing Director of Bees Recycling, Paul Bino, says although some laws are in place, much more can be done to make the sector more function more efficiently. Our Lisa Broom has the details. Barbados, like many other countries in the world, is taking steps to eliminate single-use plastics. And Paul Bino of Bees Recycling thinks one way it can fully achieve this goal is by making better use of recycling. He says more people have been recycling products in Barbados and even more are getting into the business of recycling. But the sector still needs direction. It needs government to come and say this is the way we are going. And this is the items that must be recycled. The same way we can with seatbelt law, I cannot understand. Up to now, we have not come up to the people of Barbados and said this is what we are doing when it comes to, as people see these, some of these items as garbage. And I say to you, 98% of whatever people are saying is garbage can be recycled. We need to separate our households, exactly what it is you were saying to the landfill and what is water recycling company. Meaning that you don't put everything in bag and put it outside for sanitation. If you separate the items at household, sanitation will have very little to do. Mr. Bino thinks the Sanitation Service Authority can monitor that situation. If you are not doing what you ought to do, then I'm saying to you that he can write you up there and then or should write you up there and then so that we don't have to come now with no police to, to, to police nothing. The driver of that truck or somebody on that truck can report you if you are doing the wrong thing. But right now there's no law. There's not, there, everybody do wrong thing. Well, not everybody because we do, we do go at customers and do dry tools and remove their recyclable materials. He says a culture of recycling will mean more foreign exchange and jobs and less stress on the landfill. And if you look at, let me take um, a drink bottle right now, a pet drink bottle, because everybody know that you can get back money on that particular bottle, you don't see the knocking around. But if he, if he spray the net to all plastic bottles, because all plastic bottles can be recycled. Then I'm saying to you, Barbados will be a cleaner place. We even got it in the drainage, we can get it in the gullies, and 
the place can be clean and tidy. Obese recycling ships its products to markets as close as Trinidad and to as far away as Asia and the Middle East. Lisa Broom, CBC News. Well, in 2016, Barbados imported more than 100 million plastic bags. That's according to marine biologist Nicola Simpson. She says this is of particular concern because many plastics contain toxins and chemicals linked to cancer and even a low sperm count. Passing up plastic to wrap around the island 368 times. So stop and study that. Think of Barbados and think of plastic bags going around the island 368 times. In the same year, we also imported 150,000 pounds of cups. That would be the weight of 43 ZR vans. So now picture that. Think of 43 ZR vans across the road and think of them filled with plastic. We also imported 140,000 pounds of straws. That's enough to fill nine 40 foot containers. So we have a lot of plastic. And with the introduction of the ban on single-use plastics, retailers and vendors have started using the alternative products. But Ms. Simpson points out that they too are single-use. And already I'm starting to see them on the road in the water. So unfortunately, many individuals have a littering problem. So the ban is not going to change that. We need to continue working in schools, educating, not only working in schools, in markets, on the docks, working everywhere and trying to shift mindsets and, and choose reusable where possible. But again, that doesn't always work. Now on Tuesday, we broke the news that Barbados has created history by becoming the first small nation and small island developing state in the world to host the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, or UNCTAD. Joining us live now to put it all in perspective is international trade specialist Janika Roberts. Udo, good evening to you. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you for having me. If you could just break it down for us, what is UNCTAD? Well, UNCTAD 15 is actually the quadrangle. UNCTAD is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And this will be the 15th conference that we that UNCTAD will be having. And this is the arena in which discussions are had from 194 countries which make up UNCTAD across the world. And they're had on topics that affect every single Barbadian. We talk about climate change, they talk about uh, economic shocks and recovery. We also speak about the blue economy, and there's also conversations about a myriad of things. How significant was the bid for us? This is huge. Um, this is the first small island developing state who has been allowed to host this conference. And this would have come about with a lot of hard work on the part of Ambassador Chad Blackman and his team in Geneva, and also on behalf, on the part of the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Dr. Minister Dr. Jerome Walcott, and the Minister of Tourism and their respective teams. Um, it would have come about where Barbados would have gone ahead and we would put forward, forward a proposal. Uh, there would have also been other proposals put mm -hmm. forward, specifically by the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. And in what is a beautiful piece of self-self cooperation, we came together and decided that we are always better together than we could ever be apart, which is part of what the multilateral system is really about. So we came to an agreement where Barbados would host the UNCTAD conference and the smaller conferences around that, which usually happen about five days before. That includes the World Youth Forum, the Civil Societies Forum and such. And the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi will hold the World Investment Forum and they will co-chair here with us and we will co-chair there with them. And it's a beautiful opportunity for everyone to come together and work hard. And it's a kudos to the fact that within seven months of arriving in Geneva, Ambassador Blackman managed to work with his team and get it done. Indeed, and there are expected major economic benefits from this and more than 3,000 people are coming in. Just talk to us about the spin-off benefit. Indeed, there is an estimated 20 million US dollars in benefits. Mm. There's the initial stimulus that's going to happen when you have 194 t um, countries who send their teams to Barbados. That's hotels, that's food, that's tourism activities. We trade professionals like to have fun. Um, there's also going to be the benefit of Here's an opportunity for the small, medium, and large enterprises in Barbados to show what they're capable of. 
to have an opportunity to link with people from across the world and see where your products could fit into that scheme, where you could be exporting and what opportunities are out there for you to grasp. And also you might already be exporting to a country and may have some issues. So here's your opportunity to attempt to put that on the floor and, and have a conversation about that. Um, there's also the great opportunity for Barbados as a country this allows us to be seen as a leader on this kind of level of trade and development. It's also going to be an opportunity for us to help set the agenda for this conference. So it gives us an opportunity to put issues from Barbados, for the region, and for small island developing states right at the forefront of the discussions that are going to be had. And we are going to be co-chairing this conference for the next four years. That's four years of opportunities for us to be right there in the middle, getting our issues heard and addressed. And that's really important. And the other half of that in Barbados, we love to say it's mm -hmm. not what you know, but who you know. Oh, so here's an opportunity to get in close and personal with international organizations from around the world. And so our officials will have an opportunity to build relationships, build connections that can only ever benefit us in the future. Of course, lots to look forward to Unktar 2020. Indeed. Thank you so much. That's International Trade Specialist Janika roberts Odo. Well, more males are being encouraged to join the teaching profession. That call from chairman of the Erdison Teachers Training College, Sylvia Henry. And she made the appeal at the opening ceremony for the start of the orientation for the 2019-2020 academic year at that facility. More than half of these 272 new students pursuing certificates in six areas at the Erdison Teachers Training College this year are female. It's a statistic that is certainly of interest and chairman of Erdiston Teachers Training College, Dr. Sylvia Henry, wants to see more men leading in the classrooms. Teaching is not a profession only for women. Some people believe that women are natural nurturers of children and that teaching may be a profession for women. But I want to say to you, it is not. Men are highly respected and are required in the teaching profession. Principal Dr. Patricia Saul told the students to seek to make a positive impact on every child they interact with. Be ever cognizant of the fact that the quality of teachers and the teaching that they provide are decisive factors in achieving educational improvement and national development. So you are really nation builders, and you need to see yourself as that. And in his feature address, Dr. Patrick Rowe called on them to help children develop soft skills. As educators and, you, and school leaders, we must remember that your job is not just to teach a subject, but that it is to teach how to solve problems and think critically. You must foster creativity and encourage your charges to approach the problems that confront us from new and different perspectives. You must develop in your children those so called, those so -called sorry, soft skills that will allow them to work together in teams and get the job done. The event also included the official opening of an aquaponics farm on the campus. Rianne Phillips, CBC News. The National Cultural Foundation has adopted new methods to ensure more Barbadians are educated about the Day of National Significance. Now, the Day of National Significance is observed annually on July 26 and commemorates the riots which occurred here in 1937. In past years, the foundation hosted folk concerts to celebrate the event, but Chief Cultural Officer Andrea Wells says that this will not be the case this year. She explains several activities, including a resource guide, outdoor painting workshops, a radio series and a comic have been developed to spread the message to more people. The resource booklet called 1937 will draw on actual historical documents, photographs, um, writings from some of our creatives who look back on that era and have a series of creative activities and experiments that can be used to teach and to inform about this moment in our history. 
But this workbook, while very, very, very important, is only one in a series of activities that the NCF has started and has undertaken. And collectively, we have committed to um, spreading the word and giving greater information to all of our constituents about the importance of the 1937 riots. Regional stories now, and first in Trinidad and Tobago, where a group called the La Romaine Migrant Support has been hosting a free school for migrant children for the past three months. They're now calling on churches and other groups to set up some similar facilities. There's been no clear intention or policy to treat with the education of Venezuelan children in this country. But children whose schooling has been stalled or stopped indefinitely stand to be significantly affected. For the past three months, LARMS or Laramine Migrant Support has opened its doors to migrant children. We have 60 registered migrant children and um, we teach them English, math, music, coming on just now hopefully uh, social interacting with each other because they have been shut in for long periods of time. We had nine-year-olds that were uh, in homes for, um, for 12 hours at a time. The St. Benedict's Roman Catholic Church in La Romaine provides room and donations, allowing these children a space from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on weekdays when their parents are at work. People feel because they look a particular way that things are not hard for them. Things are very, very hard for them. Their babies sleep on the ground. They cook in a tin and share that whatever they cook and wash a plate and hand it to the next person to eat. It's very, very hard. Every week also, we give them food and clothing because a lot of them come with only what they have on. The children are broken up into three age groups. Every day new mothers enroll their children, but space is limited. It's why the group is urging others to establish similar schools across the country. Guyana's public service is expected to benefit significantly from revenues generated from the production of oil. Every penny that Ghana gets from the oil and gas sector will be used in an efficient and productive manner. This assurance is coming from the Minister of Finance, Winston Jordan, who posited that no money will be expended on a project like that of the Skellen Sugar Factory. Apart from improvements in physical infrastructure across the country, the government is promising that smart classrooms will become a reality in most schools. On a human resource side, there will be training in all areas. Almost 1,600 scholarships as of June of this year have already been awarded. We can expect a ramping up on that. Uh, we could expect the monies being used to support uh, areas such as um, social assistance, our uh, disadvantaged communities and people. If the government sticks to its plan, the disabled and public servants inclusive of the disciplined services will all see benefits. So we are going to be looking at facilities housing, you know, health, schooling. So people will gravitate to those places. And as first oil approaches, the minister reminded that Ghana has a very small population, adding that the oil and gas sector demands high skills, which Ghana doesn't possess. So a large number of those skills uh, has to be imported. Um, and anything that has to be imported means that foreign exchange will be going out of the country and not staying in Guyana. Antigua and Barbuda has accused Europe and the Organization for Economic Cooperation for Development, or OECD, of seeking to push Caribbean countries out of the business of providing international financial services. St. John's is also suggesting that CARICOM countries take the matter before the World Trade Organization. Addressing the annual general meeting of the Caribbean Association of Audit Committee members, Prime Minister Gaston Brown said that the Caribbean region is under assault by forces in the external community who have disguised the plans to dismantle the region's financial sector through various measures. Now I thought that tonight I would showcase some of my dancing skills at Mackinac Thursdays. But on second thought, I think I'll save some of my energy for this weekend at Boda. In the meantime, taking some of this action.
Yeah, apparently it has been doing pretty good. Um, so the Warriors is getting good rotation here in Barbados, but it's also getting pushed in Trinidad. But they made some links with some DJs on radio stations in Trinidad, and they love the song, so they've been pushing the song in Trinidad as well. I believe that there's been a vast improvement. I feel a lot better and more confident in my songs this year than I did last year, and I believe that. I will somehow progress up, up, up in 10 days to progress a little further. I'll probably advance to the finals this year for sure. This is my third time doing it, my third year singing, and my second time in the semi-finals. The break is nice! And this is the start of Papova. Barbados, 246. Yeah, here, Papova. I will support 100% so I got every time.